Welcome to another episode of the Market Makers in Middle East and Africa podcast. I am your host Abrar Hussain. Today I speak to Antonio Di Cecca, the CEO at the Breed. Antonio, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you very much for inviting yeah. me. Antonio, a very successful career, decades of experience in energy sector. Tell us about your story. Well, it's uh, not extraordinary but uh, very interesting uh, as you said from the energy sector perspective. Uh, I've been almost 25 years now in the energy sector, started in Europe uh, with NG uh, on my main assignment were <coughs> in Paris, uh, dealing with uh, different uh, uh, topics in uh, energy. Um, I have been also spending five years in the International Energy Agency in Paris and uh, I landed here in uh, UAE almost six years ago, also with NG and uh, dealing with district cooling. And today I uh, am in Tabrid uh, in the last uh, one and a half year, uh, dealing with uh, uh, operations, maintenance, HSE projects, etc. Perfect. Thank you very much for sharing that, Antonio. Tell us a bit more about Tabrid, what Tabrid does, and tell us about the distinct cooling solutions. Well, Tabrid is uh, the largest district cooling uh, operator worldwide. Uh, it's a public listed company uh, and uh, has been uh, also operating uh, uh, in the region in the last 25 years. Actually, this year we celebrated 25 years uh, of existence. Uh, we are present uh, mainly in uh, UAE, Abu Dhabi and Dubai, uh, but also in the other Emirates. Uh, and uh, uh, we have also regional presence in Oman, Bahrain, Saudi and recently also India and Egypt. And... We have, when you mentioned district cooling solution, how are they different from the traditional cooling solutions and are they more environment friendly? District cooling is a centralized solution that uh, the main uh, objective is to be more energy efficient and more sustainable than conventional cooling solutions. What does this mean? We centralize the production in a, a plant, central plant, and then we distribute the chilled water through underground pipes to the buildings. And uh, uh, so we benefit of uh, industrial uh, machines, of the expertise of skilled teams to operate and maintain this uh, uh, equipment. And we benefit of the diversity factor in the demand. So all these effects combined makes uh, the solution more energy efficient, so half, or I would say 50% more efficient than uh, air-cooled conventional uh, solutions, plus uh, the benefit in terms of CO2 savings that uh, come from this. Wow, so 50% more cost kind of efficient than the traditional cooling system. I, mean, which is I wouldn't say cost efficient, but energy efficient. Energy yes. efficient. Wow, wow, this is, this is very good, yeah. Coming to the world of district cooling, what are the key trends or advancement that are happening in this kind of domain? First of all, I think we need to have uh, an overview of what uh, is the trend in cooling uh, demand uh, worldwide. Because as, you, as we see, uh, cooling is becoming more and more important in international fora. And there is a reason for that. When we think about uh, the building sector, building sector represents more than 30% of final energy consumption worldwide and associated CO2 emissions almost another, almost 30%. Uh, these are figures from 2021, but we are very, I mean, of course now is a bit higher. Uh, and uh, uh, so basically uh, heating and cooling are more than half of the consumption of electricity in a building. Uh, and other uh, natural gas uh, in a building. Um, out of it, uh, we need to consider also the effect on the, uh, peak electricity demand. When we look at countries like UAE, basically in summer, 70% of the peak electricity demand is because of use of air conditioning, is because of cooling. Addressing cooling demand is essential if we want to have uh, more sustainable um, outcome of all this. This is the concept. So thank you for sharing that, Antonio. You mentioned that 
it definitely better for the environment what are the challenges to kind of have district cooling implemented is it like capex heavy or is it difficult to maintain getting pipes to each building so share that as well with us uh, sure this is uh, of course uh, challenges can be also opportunities for us and for all the district cooling sector first of all district cooling is not uh, well developed everywhere in the world uh, overall district cooling market is less than 5% world- worldwide but a big penetration uh, in US uh, in uh, uh, the GCC region and especially UAE uh, which are pioneer uh, uh, in the in development of uh, these uh, cooling solutions um and uh, uh, of course we are facing uh, challenges and uh, uh, this comes these challenges come from different uh, uh, areas if we look at uh, let's start with the regulation uh, regulation is uh, both opportunity and challenge uh, the reg- the cooling market has been regulated uh, uh, in UAE since 2020 uh, both dubai and abu dhabi um, and uh, of course, the aim of the regulation is to promote district cooling. But at the same time, we need to face a different environment uh, where we need to comply, of course, with the regulation. But we also need to make people understand what are the benefits. And this is the biggest challenge for us. Because since district cooling is not well known, people they have a misperception of this as expensive. The first thing, if you ask anyone in the street, that knows about this cooling a, a bit, but if you ask what is the main benefit, they will not answer immediately energy efficiency, for example. But if you ask them what is the main challenge, they will let's tell you it's very expensive. And this is the mm, misperception that has to be corrected. And this starts from the regulation. It's uh, also policy makers, policy framework, that educate people and advocacy for these f- energy efficient solutions like district cooling. And then, of course, when the business model is different and is not understood by the, cast- the, the final user, uh, this misunderstanding uh, can be created. So our aim also is to make, uh, and this is why I'm here also, to make more people understand what is this solution, why it is more efficient, why it is more cost-effective at the end of the day. Because when you consider a standalone solution, what you do, you buy your equipment and you spend that money just for the equipment that you install in your house. Then you forget that you have to maintain it, that at certain point you have to replace it because there is a a life uh, duration for this equipment, etc., etc., all additional costs that you are facing during the lifetime. When you go with district cooling, you basically outsource all this problem to the district cooling operator. His district cooling operator is investing upfront, is creating the infrastructure, is maintaining, and basically uh, it outsource everything from you in terms of uh, burden about the cooling. So when we wait all this and we compare one solution with the other, we can understand where district cooling can be more cost effective on a lifetime of 25 years. Mm. Mm. Um, This is very interesting to know. And Antonio, my next question is on the same lines that Tabrid is a large player in the district cooling space and might have done large projects. Talk us about a large project which has significant positive impact on the communities or on the city. Uh, As I said, Tabrid is uh, mainly present in UAE uh, and also uh, in GCC, but uh, um, our landmark projects uh, are in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Uh, For example, uh, Sheikh Zayed Mosque is connected to a district cooling scheme and you can see the affluence of in in the mosque especially during uh, prayers and uh, uh, Eid, uh, all these uh, uh, events. Uh, and always we are 
reliable source for cooling for these uh, buildings. Um, and this is uh, a, make us proud to, to, to serve the community. As well as uh, another example can be all the uh, parks in uh, Abu Dhabi, Yas Island. All of them are connected to district cooling, uh, Ferrari World, uh, Warner Brothers for the recent Sea World. And this is also a sign that certain developers are understanding the importance of the sustainability for cooling and they are going with the most efficient solutions like Miral. Uh, in Dubai, we have uh, du the example of Dubai downtown. Uh, there are four plants interconnected. It's all uh, supplied. All these buildings are uh, supplied by district cooling. And uh, uh, this is a significant savings in electricity and CO2 emissions. I mean, Sheikh's Al Mosque and the Yes Island example is very interesting. So can the district cooling adjust the peak demand or it can come down once the demand is less. Let's say, for example, during the rush hours, if the more people are coming, it will adjust to the demand. And if less people are there, it will it will do that. Yes, uh, this is one of the main advantage of uh, uh, district cooling systems is that uh, it, they are very flexible and of, uh, they adjust uh, supply and demand as well, the same way as electricity systems do. The plants uh, supplying electricity and the network uh, with the transporting electricity and the consumer using electricity. So the demand, uh, the supply is, uh, uh, of course, <laughs> meeting the demand. And this is what happens with district cooling. We benefit also from the diversity factor, which, is, which means that Cooling is not uh, peaking at the same time uh, in all types of buildings. We have residential buildings where, for example, during the week, uh, in the morning, the cooling demand is lower because people are going to office and office demand for cooling is higher. But the same plant is supplying both types of customers. So we benefit reducing the installed capacity, so reducing the electricity consumption, reducing the capex that has to be spent for the electricity system, so the electricity infrastructure for the substations, and finally for the electricity supply. So it's a win-win solution for everyone. Oh yeah, I mean, this is very interesting. I didn't thought about it in that way that one, even the households or individual owners doesn't have to invest so much in building the infrastructure for the peak demand. So once the peak demand is there, district cooling supplies and reduces once the demand is less. So that's very, very interesting. How do you see the future of district cooling evolving given that there is a lot of urbanization and a demand for sustainable energy solutions? Well, this year uh, UAE will host uh, the COP28, which is a great uh, opportunity for uh, energy efficient solution to show up and uh, demonstrate that something is already in place and it's working. Uh, there are District cooling is an effective solution, is commercially viable, it's already proven. So it's just the deployment that is slow and for many reasons. Uh, but our aim, as well as the regulator uh, aim in this country, is to increase the market share of district cooling to uh, demonstrate that we can tackle the problem of peak electricity demand and cooling increasing demand through this uh, systems. Perfect. Now coming to my another question, I know that the breathe is a member of World Utility Congress. How does these collaboration helps in the advancement of the technology or the district cooling solution? And if you want to talk about any other collaborations as well, please share that with us. Our participation in World Utility Congress, this is the second year, we are uh, uh, very proud to be member of uh, uh, this event. Uh, because uh, it uh, makes us uh, uh, having a complete picture of the utility market in UAE and beyond, because this is an international event and many countries are uh, participating, more and more countries are participating. And being at the same level of other utilities, like water and electricity, it's, uh, uh, it's very, very important 
because it means that also cooling and district cooling can be considered as a utility. When you switch on your electricity in your house, you don't think about is this a service that I will have always or it's not going to happen if uh, you, you, you turn on your water, is coming. Well, the same way you turn on the AC, it's coming. It's coming yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a utility and it's a, a something, it's an essential need for uh, people. Perfect, thank you. Now, coming to the broader context of, as you mentioned, COP27 is happening here. And then we have, uh, you know, a lot of discussion on sustainability and it's kind of becoming mainstream now. How does the district cooling solution can play a role in this broader context of sustainability and achieving climate goals? As said, the main purpose of decarbonizing uh, the building sector is to tackle the problem of the energy consumption. Uh, and the main source of energy consumption, especially in this region, is coming from cooling. But worldwide also is the thermal needs of the buildings that are producing the highest level of CO2. So if we want to decarbonize the building sector, we need to find effective solutions that can be scalable and can be applied to the entire sector. Well, district cooling offers this possibility to decarbonize the building sector through this system, which is more energy efficient, as we said. So 50% more energy efficiency means also 50% less CO2 emissions related to cooling production. And the thing that district cooling is a flexible system, as we said, we can plug in any renewable source solar, geothermal, all these available and natural resources locally available can be plugged in directly in the system without affecting the demand. And this will make our customer benefiting directly of renewable source for their cooling. <clears throat> what advice will you give to young professionals who wants to come to the energy industry, particularly, you know, in the industry of district cooling or sustainable kind of, you know, energy solutions. So what you will tell them? I think that advocacy is always very important to make people interested in something that is not well known. And district cooling is an example. This is why we are cooperating a lot with universities locally with uh, initiative from government to involve more and more young professionals in our business. And this starts from education. So there are programs uh, in the universities here. We have uh, established also a cooperation with the Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi to have modules on district cooling in, uh, uh, in the course of their uh, uh, activities. And we also invite young professionals to join us as trainee and then join us uh, to understand our uh, uh, business. PhD uh, candidates also, they are very welcome for us. So we try to establish this connection uh, with uh, uh, the young generations because we believe that if we don't educate young people to this kind of technologies, this will be not possible, not known, uh, and we cannot spread it uh, in a broader way as we aim. Mm, perfect. My last question, Antonio. What's the good thing of being a COO of, uh, of Tabrid and how, you know, kind of you make an impact? Well, this question is very tricky because when you ask me this in this precise moment, I think that I have more than 1,000 people working on the field every day to be uh, there for the community and to serve the community with a reliable service every single hour, every day, every all the year. We don't have even one minute we can stop 
our supply because, as I said, is essential. Is essential for living, especially in this in these countries in in, in uh, GCC in UAE. So uh, it's a big responsibility, and I think we have a very positive impact on the communities. The the thing that I would like uh, to have is more interest in our business, understand that uh, it's uh, an essential business and make uh, our customers happy, which is uh, also our job. Perfect. Pleasure to talk to you, Antonio, and thank you very much for coming. It's really uh, a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much.